Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll start in just less than a minute. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the Bronco Family Space Virtual Grand Opening. Um, before we get started, we just want to take a moment to um, acknowledge the land that we're on. So the University Library recognizes that the Tongva Gabrielino people as the original caretakers of this land since time immemorial. Tolvagar, Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands and the village of Toibingna, Pomona, where we live and work in our unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Tongva Gabrielino peoples. It is in this space and on, the, I, I, and on this land that we pay our respects to and stand in great appreciation of these ancestors, elders, and all relations past, present, and emerging. So my name is Sally Romero. Welcome again. I am the education librarian here at Cal Poly Pomona Library. Um, as the heart of the campus community um, and a place for inspiration and discovery, creativity and collaboration, the University Library is excited to introduce our Bronco family space located on the third floor of the library. The overall goal of our Bronco family space is to provide a family friendly environment and space for the families in our campus community. Our specially designed space features interactive materials for children and caregivers, including board and picture books, age appropriate toys, puzzles, dramatic play items, and blocks providing a rich space for children to explore. We're also developing our ever growing children's collection that they, that's diverse and representative of our community. Children need to be able to see themselves in the children's collection, and we are working hard to build a collection that highlights the identity of different communities. We are developing a collection with a wide range of children's literature from board books to young adult collection. We want our collection to appeal to all age groups. Hi everyone, my name is Chizana Navarro Cruz and I am faculty in, early, in the Early Childhood Studies Department in the College of Education and Integrative Studies. We are excited to have a space that will be for students, staff, faculty, and the community to feel welcomed. We want to take this moment to, to thank our colleagues, Dr. Brianne Davila and Ms. Julie Shen in their imperative work in helping develop this space with us. Both Dr. Davila and Ms. Shen were critical partners in developing and implementing the space we have here today. The Bronco family space is especially important for Cal Poly Pomona student parents, students attending higher education while raising a child. Dr. Davida and I conducted a research project on student parents that informed us of the need to better support student parents in higher education. We found that student parents wanted a space they could bring their children while they study and somewhere where they can connect with other student parents. The Bronco family space is our first step to ensuring Cal Poly Pomona families have a space that is welcoming and allows them to learn together. Libraries are an essential space for learning together in this, um, for learning together. It creates a fun and welcoming environment where children along with their caregivers can play, learn and grow together. Spaces like our Bronco Family Space, space play a critical role in a young child's growth and development. Not to mention, it allows for the opportunity for family and community support. The Bronco family space is where children can discover the joy in learning, creating, and inventing, while their parents and caregivers can feel included and welcomed. And now we would like to introduce you all to the Bronco family space.
And now with us, Pat Hawthorne, Dean of the University Library. Hi there, thank you everyone for coming. My name is Pat Hawthorne and I'm the Dean of the University Library. The library is the geographical center of campus and one of the most heavily used buildings on campus. Yesterday, we welcomed over 6,700 students back into the library as we returned to campus. It was so vibrant and we in the library were just so excited the students are back. For much of the campus community, they see the library as a second space away from outside the classroom, their home away from home. And we recognize the library is essential to student success and academic achievement. Many of our campus community members use library services, but they're not just students. Many of them are also caregivers, whether they're parents or they're caring for younger siblings or younger family members. Our goal was to recognize the needs of this community and create an inclusive and welcoming family space inside the library, a place where a parent can study and expand their horizons while succeeding in their own academic studies. And in the same place and space, the younger family member can enjoy fun books to read, toys to encourage creativity and ingenuity, and space where they can um, imagine and problem solve and hopefully um, find a welcoming space that they might want to attend and be a Cal Poly student in the future. We did not create this space ourselves. There were many groups involved in the planning and development stage. The library worked collaboratively with Early Childhood Studies Department, the Sociology Department, and the Office of Student Success. The Bronco Family Space is an invaluable addition to our library services. With this addition, we continue our promise of improving access and equity for the entire Cal Poly Pomona campus community. And we hope that for those students who are in caregiving roles, that they'll find that this space welcomes them and um, the younger family members and those in their care that are here with them. It is now my privilege to introduce Terry Gomez. Dr. Gomez is one of our key partners in this endeavor and a champion for Cal Poly Pomona students. She serves as the Associate Provost for Student Success, Equity and Innovation here at Cal Poly Pomona. For more than 20 years in the California State University system, she has held several positions prior to her current role, including Professor and Chair of Ethnic and Women's Studies, Founding Director for the Poly Transfer Program, and Associate Dean of the College of Education and Integrative Studies. Dr. Gomez serves as the Principal Investigator for a Department of Education Title V Hispanic Serving Institution grant, Project Caminos, which focuses on developing a pipeline for Latinx and other underserved high school and community college students into Cal Poly Pomona. Dr. Gomez earned both her bachelor's and master's and her doctorate in political science at UCLA. It's my pleasure to turn this over to a key partner for the University Library. Thank you so much, Dean Hawthorne. I have to tell you, I, I am in tears, tears of joy seeing this space. This is so beautiful. And I'd like to acknowledge, obviously, the, the partnership of the library, uh, but in particular, the leadership of Dr. Davila and Dr. Navarro Cruz, who championed this project, were undeterred in a pandemic, they were gonna see this come to fruition and here it is. Uh, part of why we support these initiatives is that we, um, we have to be called out as a university on areas where we're not doing our job. And when we're talking about student success, uh, transfers were often sidelined in that vision of, transfer, uh, of student success and a subpopulation of transfer students that often goes neglected on our campus has been student parents. Not that first time freshmen aren't parents as well, but when you look at the majority of our transfer students, many of them are parents. And the university hasn't done a good enough job of serving their needs. And so I am just thrilled to partner in a small way uh, with, with, uh, with this, the leadership here and Dr. Davila and Dr. Navarro Cruz and to say that we hear you We've heard you, we will do more. This is just one of many things that we need to do to better serve our student parents. And I can tell you when I started at, UC, at Cal Poly, I had young children. I would love to have them in a space like this. And I can't wait to be back on campus tomorrow so that I can go visit the space. So on, on behalf of the administration, President Coley, 
I want to thank all of you for being here, for christening this space, uh, and for holding us accountable to make sure that we serve all of our students' needs. So uh, have a great day, and thank you for being here. This is wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Terry Gomez, for your continued support in the development of the Bronco family space. Um, we have us today to celebrate our grand opening two special guests, authors of the book Jefferson Actually, Catherine Trejo and Scott Martin Rowe. Um, give me a And just a quick bio on um, both of them. Catherine, Catherine Trejo is a first generation Salvadorian American college student graduate with a bachelor's degree in politics and Latin American Latino studies from UC Santa Cruz. She lives in historic Filipino town with her Boston Terrier, Lily, mom, brother, cousins, aunt, grandma, niece, and nephew, all in the same apartment complex where she was raised. She enjoys spending time with friends and family, watching cartoons and listening to K-pop. She co-authored this book with Mr. Scott Martin Rowe, one of her most influential and favorite teachers in high school. And then we also have Scott Martin Rowe with us. He is a National Board Certified Teacher Librarian in the Los Angeles Unified School District and the first in his family to graduate from college. Aside from teaching, he enjoys reading, writing, running, and spending time with his family and friends. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife, writer Catherine Martin Rowe, his four energetic children, one lazy dog, and a, an opinionated cat. Though he has many favorite students from his 15 years of teaching, Catherine Trejo is one of his most favorite, but don't tell the others. And just a little um, insight on their book, Jefferson Actually, so the book follows Jefferson as he learns to overcome what is a common but often undiscussed hurdle for all shy kids entering a new school year, teaching people how to say your name correctly. In a picture book market that too often doesn't highlight Latinx boys as the main character of their own stories, Jefferson stands up and stands out for his kindness, gentleness, and strength when he treats others how he wants to be treated. So please um, give a warm welcome to Catherine Trejo and Scott, Scott Martin Rowe. Hey, thanks, Sally. Thank you so much for having us um, here today. Um, we're super excited to be here. I am going to share my screen uh, so I can bring up the book. So just hang in there with me. Give me a second. I too am happy to be here. <laughs> I'm not really in San Francisco, though that sounds nice. Um, but the back room of the library here is a little dirty, so I thought I'd give you something else to look at. All right. Okay. So this is Jefferson, actually. One second. Perfect. All right. Let's get started, Mr. Rowe. All right. So I'm going to read the English portion of the book, and Kathy's going to read the Spanish portion of the book. It's my first day at my brand new school. Hoy es mi primer día en mi nueva escuela. My mom moved to a new hospital. She's an orthopedic surgeon. She can name and locate all 209 bones in the body from memory. Mi mamá se cambió a un nuevo hospital. Ella es una cirujana ortopédica. Mi mamá puede nombrar y ubicar los 209 huesos del cuerpo de memoria. My dad is an artist. Every year on my birthday, he paints a portrait of me and Papa Jefferson. Mi papá es un artista. Todos los años para mi cumpleaños, pinta un retrato mío con Papa Jefferson. Papa Jefferson mostly stays home and works in our garden. Papa Jefferson se queda principalmente en casa y trabaja en nuestro jardín. I was named after him, which is so cool because he is my favorite person. Me pusieron su nombre, lo cual es genial, porque él es mi persona favorita. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I want to introduce you to our new friend. This is Jefferson. Buenos días a todos y bienvenidos. Quiero presentarles a nuestro nuevo amigo. Este es Jefferson. Uh, it's actually... Eh, en realidad... 
let's welcome Jefferson to our school. Demos la bienvenida a Jefferson a nuestra escuela. Um, hi. Uh, hola. Jefferson, I've never had to start over anywhere. I've had the same friends for as long as I can remember, and we've always known the sounds and spellings of one another's names like they belong to us. Nunca he tenido que empezar de nuevo en ningún lado. He tenido los mismos amigos desde que me acuerdo, y siempre hemos sabido los sonidos y la ortografía de los nombres de los demás como si nos pertenecieran. Nobody else got my name right for the rest of the day. Jefferson, 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 Jefferson. Nadie dijo mi nombre correctamente por el resto del día. Jefferson, 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 Jefferson. Hey, Jefferson, want to play kickball with us? Oye, Jefferson, ¿quieres jugar a la traes con nosotros? By the way, are you named after Thomas Jefferson or something? Por cierto, ¿te llamas así en honor a Thomas Jefferson o qué? No, I'm named after my grandpa. No, me llamo así en honor a mi abuelo. Is your grandpa named after Thomas Jefferson? ¿Tu abuelo se llama así en honor a Thomas Jefferson? I don't think so. No creo. Your turn, Thomas Jefferson. Tu turno, Thomas Jefferson. That's not my name. Eso no es mi nombre. I had a lot of confusing feelings after school. Every night at dinner time, my family goes around and has to share one positive thing from their day. It seemed like everyone had a good day. And then it was my turn. Tuve muchos sentimientos confusos después de la escuela. Todas las noches durante la cena, vamos uno por uno en mi familia compartiendo alguna cosa positiva de nuestro día. Parecía que todos tuvieron un buen día y luego era mi turno. I don't think anyone named Jefferson has ever gone to that school. Everyone got my name wrong today. Creo que esta es la primera vez que alguien llamado Jefferson va a esa escuela. Hoy nadie dijo mi nombre correctamente. What did you say when they said it wrong? ¿Qué les dijiste vos cuando lo dijeron mal? Nothing. Nada. What would you have liked to tell them? ¿Qué te hubiera gustado decirles? Well, I like how the Y stands compared to a J, and I like the sound the Y makes in Spanish, and mostly I like it because it's the same as Papa Jefferson, and I want to be like him when I grow up. Bueno, a mí me gusta la altura de la Y en comparación con la J, y me gusta el sonido que hace la Y en español. Y sobre todo me gusta porque tengo el mismo nombre que Papa Jefferson, y quiero ser como él cuando sea grande. So what are you going to say tomorrow when they say your name wrong? ¿Y vos qué les vas a decir mañana cuando pronuncien mal tu nombre? It's Jefferson, actually. En realidad es Jefferson. Good morning, class. Today we will learn about how plants make their own food through a process called photosynthesis. Has anyone here ever heard of photosynthesis? Buenos días. Hoy vamos a aprender cómo las plantas hacen su propio alimento a través de un proceso llamado fotosíntesis. ¿Hay alguien aquí que haya escuchado alguna vez sobre la fotosíntesis? Yes. Jefferson? Sí. Jefferson? It's Jefferson, actually. My grandpa taught me that the tomato plants in our garden use photosynthesis. En realidad es Jefferson. Mi abuelo me enseñó que las plantas de tomate en nuestro jardín usan fotosíntesis. Hello, Jefferson. Enjoy your lunch. Hola, Jefferson. Que disfrutes tu almuerzo. It's Jefferson, actually. And thank you. I love pepperoni pizza. En realidad es Jefferson. Y gracias. Me encanta la pizza de pepperoni. You're up, Thomas Jefferson. Te toca, Thomas Jefferson. It's Jefferson, actually. And you better back up. En realidad es Jefferson. Y mejor empiecen a correr. How was your day at school, Cipote? ¿Cómo fue en la escuela, Cipote? Much, much better, actually. Mucho, pero mucho mejor. Hey, Jefferson. Oye, hey, Jefferson. Jefferson? Jefferson? Here. 
Rosenta. Have a good lunch, Jefferson. Que disfrutes tu almuerzo, Jefferson. Great kick, Jefferson. Buen tiro, Jefferson. Good morning, class. Today we have a new student. Her name is Jessica, and she just moved here from. Buenos días. Hoy tenemos una nueva alumna. Su nombre es Jessica, y recién se mudó de. <clears throat> it's Jessica, actually. <clears throat> en realidad es Jessica. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy and Scott, so much for sharing this book with all of us and for reading it both in English and in Spanish. I, um, I, I love it. I have two children. I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old who I'm excited to read this book to, who are bilingual as well, and one on the way um, that is due any moment now. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm super excited to share this book with them. And for me, this book really stands out because we we value children and one way with that we value them is by acknowledging their name who's which is part of their identity so i want to open this 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 time up for any of our participants if they have any questions or answers for you all um to and I, so i'll look at the chat I'll try to monitor it um while we have some questions coming in i have a question on what inspired you to write this book yeah i can answer that. So the book is actually inspired by my real life nephew, Jefferson. Um, one day, I think he was in kindergarten, I was helping him with his homework. And I was like, um, usually when you're in kindergarten, they give you like those folders, like with your name, like all the numbers, ABCs, stickers, it's jam packed with everything. And I noticed that his name was spelled with a J instead of a Y. And I was like, Oh, I was like, that's weird. Um, and I know that when you enroll your child into school, right, you give the birth certificate, all this stuff, right, and all of his legal documents are, his name is spelled with a Y. So I was like, adult or someone at school made a conscious choice to change the spelling of his name. Um, I ended up putting a, a little note to the teacher asking her to change the spelling of his name to the original with a Y and let her know that it's not misspelled or anything like that is the way that it was written. Um, and then the next day he came back with a new folder. And it got me thinking, I was like, oh, I feel like this is something that he's going to experience often. I feel like um, so many children experience this, right? Like with their names. Um, and one of the things that I never wanted my nephew to feel or any child to feel is feel like their name is a burden. You know, I feel like we all have a duty to try our best to always pronounce and say someone's name as correctly as possible. So um, that is what inspired the book, and I recruited my high school teacher, Mr. Ro I don't call him Scott, I call him Mr. Ro because I can't find it in me to not to call him Scott. Um, and yeah, and that's where the book came from. Oh, I love that story. Yeah, and you know, even in college, as us as faculty and staff acknowledging when we must pronounce our students' names, right? Because it really is really meaningful to them. It's part of their identity. So I, I really uh, enjoy it. And I, I like what you shared about your, your family member. And, you know, I think, you know, my children and how their names will be mispronounced. They have second names that are pretty tricky. Um, and they're not <laughs> one of mine. So Sebastian Ekatsin is a tricky name and Galilea oh. is a tricky name. Um, so reading this book to them so they know that their name is valuable and it's part of them and knowing a little bit of your background about your name. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any questions pop up. Um, let me see. So I have another question for you. Um, so I love and I advocate for multilingualism and the value of, you know, speaking more than one language, right? So what made you decide to write this both in Spanish and English? Well, I mean, one of the, I think one of the things is uh, we, uh, Kat, maybe you have a better sense, but I think when we uh, sent this book out to the little Libros, the idea was that they do, you know, all of their books are bilingual. Um, and then my, all of my kids uh, attend uh, a dual language immersion elementary school. So they're all learning Spanish and they're, you know, working on English in school as well. Um, so it's just like having these books around is really important for them so that they're constantly seeing English and Spanish that, you know, we're not 
trying to favor one language over the other because 95% of their day at school is in Spanish. Um, and so many kids in LA, you know, show up to school at kindergarten only speaking Spanish. Um, so why not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it's, uh, the, you know, it's all the little libros, like all of their books are in Spanish, like Mr. Rose said. Um, and it just made sense for us to partner and like publish our story at a place that really values uh, two languages. Right. Um, and it's a strength. Right. And I feel like um, the more that um, that students are seeing uh, their language and the language that they're learning or vice versa, I think the more, you know, the more more powerful it is for them to continue to want to keep learning. And that leads up to a, a great question that's in the chat. Can you share your thoughts on how this is also a lesson on power and empowerment? Yes. Um, it's so at the core, one of the biggest um, themes of the book is advocacy, like self-advocacy. Um, we're big proponents that children can learn advocacy really, really early on. Um, and I think that being able to, to learn advocacy is such an important skill at such a young age. Um, I even think about, you know, as they get older, this is advocacy that they're going to carry on into adulthood. So now you have students that know how to self-advocate. They're like, maybe negotiating their salary at their first job and like they're not afraid um, and it's also like advocacy that will turn to others right and other communities um, so advocacy is a, is a really big that's like the I would say one of the biggest themes in this book um, but also something that I did want to point out is that we you see that he only he doesn't just correct his peers he also corrects adults and, and I think a part, like if you're gonna, one of the things I always say is like, if you're gonna teach your child self-advocacy, like be prepared that they might use it on you too as an adult, right? And it's like being able to reciprocate and like listen to them and like hear them is such an important part. So it was really important for us to also show like the character interacting with peers and with adults because we also, cause you know, adults are not always right. <laughs> you know, sometimes we make mistakes and mm -hmm. um, you know, so, yeah. And, you know, even in high school, I, you know, I'm a high school librarian and even here and over the years in the classroom, I've had students um, who I remember in the same grade as I think the same class uh, Kathy was in where uh, her name was Jessica and it was spelled Jessica on the oh. roster. And I heard other students calling her Jessica. I heard people calling her Jessica and I asked her and I said, I want to make sure I get your name right. Is it Jessica or Jessica? And she said, it doesn't matter. And I said, no, 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 no. It totally matters. I was like, which one do you want me to use? Because you know, I hear both. And she said, well, it's Jessica. I said, okay, then I'm, that's your name. So that's the name I'm going to use for you. And um, yeah, I think it's powerful. I get it in the library too. There was a student today whose name was Yami with a Y and you know, she didn't have her id so i was looking up her name to check out a book tour and she said it's jamie with a y and i said yamie and she goes yes and i was like is yamie <laughs> like she goes it's yamie but i always say jamie with a y and i was like okay and I was, and I was like oh i don't have a copy of the book right here <laughs> i mean yeah i mean at its core like this book is really for all the children with like y names like there's so many beautiful names Yeson, Yemi, Jessica, Yasmin. I mean, the, the names go on and on. And I think it shows like, I always like to think that it's like this clash of like two cultures, right? Um, it's like Spanish and English, like kind of like competing with each other, but not really. It's like kind of coming together to like make these really awesome names with that start with Ys. Um, and, and the book is not just like Mr. Rowe was saying, like it's, you know, the fact that he didn't have the book there, he could have showed it to Yemi. Um, the book is not just for children. I, we've had so many adults and like um, and young adults be like, oh my God, like I read this book and I, I still don't feel comfortable and confident correcting people. But after reading it, I feel like it's just so much more important. So it's a book for adults as much as it is for children. I think for adults, I always like to think of it. It's like a, a little like um, healing that little inner child, right? That maybe didn't have that self-advocacy but you know, it's never too late to start learning it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You know, advocating for oneself can be challenging at times, but if they start learning it early on, 
right, to speak up for themselves. So thank you. We have a couple more questions. Um, one of them is, why is it important to have representation in children's literature? I can start. Uh, oh, you yeah. want to start, sir? Well, I'll, I'll say, um, as somebody who has children, and I have children who don't look like me, um, you know, it, it was really tough to find uh, books. It's getting a little bit better now, but, you know, 10 years ago when my son was born and he's black, um, finding books that featured black characters, just doing everyday things that kids do. It was really easy to find, you know, picture books with black characters. And a lot of the storyline was about race, but it was harder to find a book where it was just about a kid whose ice cream fell off the cone and they were sad. So um, it was, it, they were really kind of pigeonholed. And, and I think you, kids have to see themselves in, in the pages of books. They have to see themselves on TV. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all a work in progress. Um, but you, they have to, that's, they start to, you know, feel value and when they see themselves represented. And it's not something that maybe they will uh, express and say, I don't feel valued because I don't see myself in the books. But they will internalize that they're not on the page, but these other characters are. Uh, and even animals, lots of animals in children's books are blue-eyed animals um, or fair-toned bunnies and, and bears and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's kids pick up on it. Yeah, and I'll add to that that um, our book centers a Salvadorian family, which is where my family's from in Salvador. Um, and there isn't a lot of books out there that center Salvadorians. There's a, there's really just not a lot of media yet. So I feel super proud of Mr. Ro and I that we were able to like really push forward like. Um, a, a children's book that actually centers the Salvadorian family. I mean, you also see that um, we use some caliche, which is like Salvadorian like uh, slang. So we use voz, voceo in the book, and we use, also use cipote. Um, so many Salvadorians and Central Americans have reached out um, and have have reached out and have been like, oh, like, you know, just seeing the word cipote in there, like we've never seen that before. And it feels just so incredible to see it on a page, right? And it's also a great way to like introduce other children of other cultures, um, a little bit about Salvadorian culture, right? Like the words that we use um, and our illustrator Carla did such a great job of like, when they're at the dinner table, they're eating sopa de pata, which is a very traditional Salvadorian meal. And you can see like the tortillas hechas a mano, like made by hand on there. So there's like really like little details, right? That I think that, um, if you're Salvadorian or from the Central American community that you'll pick up on, right? Um, and it's such a great way to introduce children to other cultures. And just speaking on the Latinx, Latinx community, like it's so diverse. It's extremely diverse, you know, like our foods. We have so many similarities, but there's so many differences in our food, our, our culture, our language, right? And it differs from like Latin America to Latin American country, right? Um, and I think, you know, even within the Latinx community, we need more diversity, like around seeing more Black Latinx children, um, seeing more Asian Latinx children, um, seeing more indigenous centered stories uh, from Latin America. So even within our own little bubble, we definitely need to see more diversity as well. My, my favorite part about that, that dinner scene is where um, Carla was saying, the illustrator, that she drew it so that the Papa Jefferson and Jefferson have like taken the the vegetables out of their soup onto the plate and whereas the the parents the mom and dad are eating it all together and she said you know in in salvadoran culture like you if you're a grown-up you've got to eat it all in the bowl but if you're a kid or you're older you can take it all apart and put it out on the plate and eat it separately and i was like that's so amazing <laughs> and it's just like that's one of those things that you know, i know i love that detail that's so true yeah, I love I love how you should, how this book you can learn a little bit more about someone's culture, right? Um, when when I was reading it and I saw these words, I'm like, what does that mean, right? I'm Latina, but there's different words used throughout Latin America, so I love that. And you know, one of the things that I really um, admire is Sally Romero for, who's our um, librarian here at CPP for the Child and Adolescent. 
um, section, she really looked at what books we can include in that life, in that in, in the Bronco family space um, that are multicultural, that are multilingual. And with the student success money, we've been able to buy and purchase books from Little Libros, books from different places so that we can have this collection where our students, the children who visit can see themselves in these books, because as you said, Scott earlier, how, you know, it's important for children to be able to see themselves. It's important for students to be able to see themselves within these books. So thank you so much for sharing that. We have time for just a bit more questions. We have one that says, um, let's see, once you have, so I would love to know more about the writing process. Once you have an idea for a book, how do you develop the story and illustrations? And what guides you writing for children and young adults? And this might come in combination with the, another um, participant who asked, what inspired you to make a children's book too? Um, so, <laughs> I mean, that's a great question just because I feel we I feel that we're so lucky that on our first try we got we are so privileged and, so, and like just I'm so humbled by the fact that our the first book we put out got published. Um, I have a really long bucket list <laughs> that I just like keep on my notes for. <laughs> um, and one of them was one of them is like owning a grocery store, like seeing the traveling here, and um, one of them was like a children's book. So a couple of, like I I saw that and I knew I know Mr. Well, Mr. Rowe was my English teacher. He's seen all of my writing, basically seen me grow up. And um I knew that he was a writer himself. He's he's at school, y'all. So if he's it's probably because he has to help a student right now. Um and I uh, I knew he was a writer and that he had some novels. Um his wife, Kate, is also a writer. So it's just a house full of writers. So I was just like. I don't know anything about the, the, the industry. And Mr. Rowe really didn't know um, anything about the industry that much either. But he has children and he has like, like he has so many books in his house. Like his kids are so well read. Like if you ever go to his house, there's like shelves and shelves of books everywhere. Um, and one of the, the biggest advice I always give people that wanna write books or, or how to get the process started, just read a lot of children's books. Like I read them for fun. Like all the new ones coming out, I'm like, okay, so what do they do here? How did they do this? Um, so a big part of our process was like reading children's books and then just just putting something down on paper. That was like literally our goal for like about a year. We actually met every week. He would like put his like um, children to bed. His wife would be in the back writing. I would come over and we would just write um, and just figure it out as like we go. So the process was really organic and just learning as we go. And the wonderful thing about working with Mr. Rowe is that he's a teacher. <laughs> like him being able to do uh, research and bring structure to the process was like um, one of the things that I really, um, that I really enjoyed about the process. Um, and it was really just like vibing. And the most other wonderful thing is like working in partnership with someone. Like I, we weren't alone. Like we could um, vibe off of each other's ideas and just like really riff off and like just, you know, just write. But really the first step um, is really just putting it down on paper. I always tell people like, who cares about the rules? Like learn the rules as you go or learn them along the way. But really it's mm -hmm. like just getting the idea down on paper. And me and Mr. Rowe, um, we are not just writing a children's book together. We also have, we're writing like a TV pilot for a show that's also, we're learning as we go. Uh, Mr. Rose, like in school, I think you took a, a creative writing class or a screenplay uh, class. I took some screenwriting classes, yeah. <laughs> and I take I take other classes on the side, so we're constantly learning um, as we go, um, and we're constant learners. So it's a process, but I feel like if you have a story that you really care about, um, you know, I think the first thing is just putting it down on like paper, but and you know, and if you don't want to do it alone, like get someone to do it with you. I agree with that. Um, <laughs> I agree with that. I think I feel like a lot of our time was spent talking about the the what's behind the story that you actually see on the page, and trying to ensure that what uh, came out on the page wasn't too didactic. Um, so, uh, yeah, and it was a lot of like, here's where we want it to end. Here's the situation. Here's where we want it to end. How do we get from point A to point B uh, in this story? Um, and yeah, it was just a lot of. A lot of drafting and 
And with the oh, yeah. picture book too, you know, with the novel, you, ha you have a lot of space and you have a lot of words to figure out how you're going to get there. Uh, with a picture book, you don't. Um, and you also have to think about how are the illustrations going to aid um, what you're, you're doing. And we were really lucky. I think Carla, uh, who illustrated the book, who's also Salvadoran, she's up in Canada. Um, I think she had a really good sense of what, what could be on the page that would uh, complement you know, the text that we had come up with. Yeah, so it's it's really it's a process, but some some resources um, if folks are interested, like check out the Highlights Foundation. Um, they have scholarships and other like different workshops around literally like the 101 on how to write a children's book. Also check out Las Musas, who um, I did. Um, you can also through Las Musas you can find other great Latinx Latinx authors um, of every race. Um, different books from all over um, and they have some really great resources around like how to write books of um, all different levels um, so that's another great resource um, I did a, a writing into a, I did a writing fellowship with them as well that was so helpful in my process um, so those are just two really great and just read books just read a lot of children's books and kind of like figure out like you know like oh I see that you know there's like lyrical books you will see like patterns like you know just really sit down and like really just take it all in and honestly just put your just put it on paper that's like step one just put your story on paper thank you and I see Sally I already put the oh thank you Sally <laughs> to what you mentioned so that others can access it we have maybe this might be our last question um because we're running out of time but where do you recommend people shop when they want bilingual diverse books for young people well, Las, Las Musas is a great um, spot to start. If you go to their website, you'll see that they have a whole inventory of books, um, specifically Latinx and Latin A. Um, there are a, a lot of great um, like independent bookstores. Um, what's the, uh, the one in LA and the name is leaving me now. Um, La Libreria. Have, that's the one, there we go. Um, they've got a, a ton of great books. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot out there. Um, I think the library is a great place too. Uh, we go to the library every week, my kids and I, and we grab our. I can get twenty books because I'm a teacher, so I grab twenty books, and we read through the books. And some of them we love, and some of them we're like, meh, not a great book. Um, but just yeah, the library is also a really great place. I just started going again. It's been fun, but I cannot check out twenty books. I wish. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, also, book fly through. Miha Books. Miha Books is really great. Um, they have such a great collection. It, their story is awesome. They're Black and Latin owned. Um, it's like a mom and a dad who started off on Instagram, just like celebrating diverse books. And most recently, they were able to open up their own bookstore. So it's a really great uh, story. But they have a really great like little store inside of a mall. Um, it's called Miha Books. Um, and then, of course, Little Libros, you can get our book. <laughs> Little Libros has some really great books. Um, and they're, they're, they just, they're announcing so many books right now. And I'm so excited. You're going to see more stories that send her, like, Black Latinx uh, children. Um, so you're going to see so many more diverse books. And it's really exciting to just be able to be a part of, like, Little Libros growth. Um, and just be part of, like, you know, some of, like, the, like the you know, the, like, the founding, founding authors. <laughs> <laughs> that aren't Pat, Patty and Ariana. So yeah, I love I love how you finished off with little libros because we actually have a raffle for our participants who are interested in getting a book from um, Little Libros, especially from Jefferson, actually. So we have a link that I'm going to put in the chat, and and that link will send you to um, to a raffle. So any everybody who's a participant, please click on that link and then you'll be entered to win one of the Little Libros books, which we're super excited um, to give away. Uh, and we'll continue, we'll continue. Um, it, it won't close automatically. So hopefully everybody is able to click on that link. And Kathy and Scott, thank you so much for your thank time. You for having us. Uh, for, thank you for so much for having us. Oh no, we're so, we're so grateful.
Cool. And thank you all. Thank you to, to Pat um, Hawthorne, Dr. Pat Hawthorne, and Dr. Terry Gomez. And a special thank you to Sally Romero, who um, really put all of this together, as well as the library team who put all of this together. Um, and also uh, Julie Shen and uh, Dr. Brianne Davila. So we want to thank you all. And we're super excited. So please come and see the Bronco family space on the third floor. I went there yesterday with my children and my children did not want to leave and <laughs> they just love the space. So I'm super excited for uh, students, faculty, staff, community to come to this place and really enjoy the space for, for the children and for, for everybody there. Thank you all. <laughs>